Yeah, sounds good. So um, as Ansar mentioned, I think our goal going forward is to change the format of these talks a little bit, whereas before we were doing quite an in-depth, you know, half hour, 45 minute talk um, uh, on a specific topic. We're going to try and keep these more case-based um, and a little briefer in terms of content. So this is by no means an in-depth review of this topic. I think the purpose is to bring up um, an interesting patient or topic, review a little bit, and hopefully have a fair bit of time for uh, discussion and questions, which, um, you know, we would uh, welcome your feedback. If you like this format, if you want things changed, suggested topics, um, this is something we can really hopefully evolve and optimize as we uh, go forward. Um, so uh, the topic today is is SAM. Uh, so this is um, uh, systolic anterior motion is what SAM stands for. Uh, we'll get into uh, a little bit about the um, the uh, pathophysiology and treatment of of this, but we'll start first with with a case introduction uh, before we get into the nuts and bolts of the topic. So uh, this is a 49 year old gentleman um, who. Uh, last Friday um, uh, had his OR. So he's a guy that had symptomatic severe aortic insufficiency and aortic stenosis. Now it's a bit interesting that despite being 49 years of age, his valve was trileaflet. And when you read his echo report, and we'll look at his pictures, um, he had severe AI and um, some of his elevated gradients were thought to be due to the AI uh, and that his AS was not necessarily his driving pathology. Um, which I think is important when in all in retrospect, when you look at his echo pictures and his post-op course, um, he had severe concentric LVH, so not a dilated ventricle um, like a patient with aortic insufficiency. But in my mind, looking at his echo pictures now, um, you know, the degree of his LVH seemed to be out of keeping and out of context with how bad his aortic stenosis is. Uh, which which I think is important to consider going forward. He also had an ascending aneurysm. Um, so he underwent uh, an AVR, an ascending replacement. So this is his preoperative transthoracic echocardiogram. So this is left atrium here, mitral valve, left ventricle, and then you can't see it well, but this is his aortic valve going out into his ascending aorta. So you can see here that his LV is very thick. Uh, and in systole, you can see the, his, you know, his anterior and posterior walls of his LV actually touch. So his ejection fraction is, you know, nearly 100%, which, again, I think this, this speaks to how his LVH, in my mind, is out of keeping with the severity of his valve disease um, and makes you wonder now in retrospect if he doesn't have an underlying cardiomyopathy. Um, so this is just a apical four-chamber view of, of his heart, and I just wanted to, again, emphasize how thick his ventricle is and that his, his, the walls of his LV actually touch in systole, um, giving you an idea of the magnitude of severity of his LVH. And then this is, again, anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet of his mitral valve, and then this is where his LV outflow tract and aortic valve would be. And then just again, a short axis view, uh, essentially showing the same thing. Very good, yeah, very thick heart. So last Friday, he had a, a aortic valve replacement and an ascending hemiarch replace, replacement. Um, despite you know being a 49-year-old guy with predominant aortic insufficiency, the root was very small, um, and they, uh, you know, it was difficult to get a 21 millimeter. Uh, valve in which you know for a guy his size is is a bit of a small valve so again I think speaks to kind of the unique unique nature of his um, anatomy he had a fair bit of bleeding postoperatively and was returned to the operating room kind of around around six hours after his initial uh, OR and I think important another teaching point in this case is that he did not have a TEE during his take back because of the COVID era, and I think this would have been picked up possibly on, on the TE had he had it done uh, during his take back. And in retrospect, I think the elevation of a central venous pressure that was part of what prompted his return to the OR uh, may have been due to SAM in retrospect. So post um, uh, take back, he was extubated overnight, um, and initially his, his CVP was 
12, his PA pressures were, were pretty normal and he was rel he's normal tensive. Um, his lactate though was mildly elevated. His mixed venous oxygen saturation was very poor. It was in the 40% range and he was oliguric. You know, his, his urine output was kind of in the range of 15 to 20 an hour. So when I saw him the next morning, um, you know, he looked like he was grumbling, but kind of doing okay-ish. Um, and a little bit of gentle volume drove his CVP up um, and, you know, his PA pressures came up a little bit and he really did not get any better clinically. Um, over the course of the day, um, he, again, just kind of grumbled. He had progressive hypoxemic respiratory failure, which like, looked like it was predominantly due to uh, atelectasis. His whole, you know, kind of left lower lobe was down. Um, and his PA cath numbers started to look like progressive RV dysfunction. Um, so an inotrope was started, which in retrospect now was kind of the, probably the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and we'll talk about why that is. So after initiation of his inotrope, his lactate rose more, he stopped peeing, and his SVO2 did not get any better. And that was combined with a rise in his PA pressures. Uh, and we'll talk about all these things to come, but essentially this is the opposite of what you would expect to happen with initiation of an inotrope, um, and then really uh, indicates that, that SAM is what was going on here. So along with initiation of his inotropes, worsening of his pulmonary hypertension, which was due to MR in retrospect, he had progression of his hypoxemic respiratory failure and actually declined, declined quite quickly from a respiratory perspective over the span of half an hour. He went from, you know, sats of 90% on four liters nasal prong to sats of 80% on 100% high flow nasal cannula. So it was urgently reintubated. And then Andrew uh, uh, was already on his way in to echo him um, when this was, was going on. So this is his uh, transesophageal echocardiogram. Um, so just to be able to orientate you, I know this is kind of a zoomed in picture, but this is left atrium here, posterior leaflet and mitral valve, anterior leaflet and mitral valve, and LV. This is LV outflow tract and aortic valve. And so in you can see that in systole, when this anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is supposed to come up and co-opt with the posterior leaflet, instead it is being sucked over completely to the, into the LV outflow tract and actually touching the septum of the LV. And so you can appreciate that that creates a, two consequences. One is, uh, and that this is just a, a color Doppler of the exact same picture. So you can see that because of this anterior leaflet being sucked over, it creates severe MR because the mitral valve is not co-opting and it creates an obstruction of the LV outflow tract. So that's where this turbulent blood flow into the LV outflow tract is, is there was a severe uh, um, obstruction to the LV being able to empty out the aortic valve and severe mitral regurgitation. And his, the, uh, uh, the pressure gradients across his LVO flow tract, his peak pressure gradient was over 100, his mean gradient was over 50, and his, his velocity was over 5. So this is severe LVO flow tract uh, obstruction. So this confirmed our, or um, uh, revealed the diagnosis of SAM, which uh, up until this point hadn't really been on my radar um, uh, in terms of what was going on with this patient. So we'll get a little bit into the pathophysiology of SAM. And so this is what the echo pictures you just saw, um, this is representing it in, in cartoon format. So normally in systole, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve collapse with the posterior leaflet. You have a, a competent mitral valve and you have a wide open LV outflow tract for ejection. But with SAM, this anterior leaflet gets pulled over into the LV outflow tract and the consequence is MR and essentially pseudo aortic stenosis, you have LVO flow tract obstruction. Now, in terms of the kind of pathophysiology and why this happens, um, the early thought was that it was due to a venturi effect. So, if you have 
someone who has the typical scenario or classic scenarios you see Sam in is patients with hokum or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or patients who have a big bulky Barlow's mitral valve and who have a mitral valve repair. Um, and so in patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and a big bulky septum that is obstructing their LVO flow tract, the initial thoughts were that the elevated velocity in the LVO flow tract because of this narrowing essentially create a pressure low in the LVO flow tract and suck the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve over uh, causing SAM. And this is kind of the early teaching in terms of what the cause of SAM is. But with you know the advent of greater technology in terms of echocardiography um, and uh, some in vitro models, I think the um, the understanding of this pathophysiology has improved um, over the last number of years. And so um, these are some pictures of kind of alternative explanations for how this develops, which you know I think is quite interesting. So this is a normal heart or normal ish heart without papillary muscle displacement. So in this context, the normal flow should be blood flow through the left atrium, through the mitral valve, into the LV, and then it is ejected out the aortic valve. Now with, with hokum, you can have anterior papillary muscle displacement. And so what the modeling was showing is that with this pathophysiology, what you have happen is instead of the blood coming in, going in a, count, in a clockwise fashion and out the LVO outflow tract, you have a reversal of that pattern and you actually get blood flow in behind the posterior mitral valve leaflet, which then pushes the, the posterior and then anterior leaflets over into the LVO outflow tract. So this is kind of one of the new mechanisms by which SAM might occur in patients with, with hokum. Um, the other um, uh, you know, uh, theory in terms of why SAM happens in patients with with hokum is that the bulging septum forces blood flow again back behind the posterior mitral valve leaflet and then pushes the whole mitral apparatus anteriorly causing SAM. Um, and so I think it's just interesting that the pathophysiology is not as simple as what was initially described and likely patients who have a combination of this kind of anatomy in their LV are susceptible and I, you know, in retrospect, when you look at the echo of our patient, he had a very thick left ventricle. Um, you know, there's the potential for some anterior papillary muscle displacement, which is, which is what we're seeing here. His septum is a little hypertrophy, but not to a great degree. So, you know, it's clear that it's not just about um, a big bulky septum um, in terms of what might precipitate this pathophysiology. Um, so when you look at all the different risk factors for uh, the development of SAM, it, it's, it's clear that it's not just patients with hokum and not just patients who have undergone a mitral valve repair. Um, and so these are all the different risk factors that can contribute to this problem. And I think, you know, in retrospect, this patient likely had a few of these. So a small LV cavity, he definitely had this. Um, you could see that on his echo pictures. Um, he did have a narrow LVOT. You could see this on echo and, um, you know, we're only able to get a 21 millimeter valve uh, in him. So he definitely had a small LVOT. Um, then big bulky mitral leaflets are a risk factor. Asymmetrical septal hypertrophy, which um, he did not appear to, I think, have uh, uh, dramatically on his echo pictures. Um, anteriorly displaced papillary muscles. So he may have had that. Um, absolute or relative hypovolemia. So he bled. Um, and I think that contributed in this context. And then initiation of inotropes creates a hypercontractile LV, which worsens this pathophysiology. He definitely had diastolic dysfunction. Um, and then these are just a variety of echo parameters that really re-emphasize having a small LV, narrow LVOT, and big bulky um, uh, mitral leaflets. And so just going back to this picture, he had a small bulky LVOT. Um, 
just by nature of his anatomy. He had a big, thick ventricle, small LV cavity, likely had some anterior displacement of his papillary muscle. Um, and so when you throw in bleeding, some hypotension, hypovolemia, and then initiation of inotropes, you could see how this pathophysiology could develop. Uh, so then in terms of treatment of SAM, the initial treatment of this is all medical. Um, and it all focuses on trying to fill that big stiff left ventricle to be able to open it up and move the whole mitral appar apparatus posteriorly away from the septum so it's not able to obstruct the LV outflow tract. And so the first goal is to optimize filling. Uh, now our patient, his CVP was already 17. Um, and uh, I didn't think that giving additional volume was going to help us. Um, his LV was underfilled, but his RV was not. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but um, um, giving additional volume was not going to help him. But in general, these patients, you stop diuretics if they're happen having to get diuretics and give volume if you're able to. Then the other thing that's going to optimize your LV filling um, is to maintain a slow sinus rhythm. So you think of how thick and stiff his LV is. This is someone you want to be in sinus rhythm at 60 beats a minute. Um, now he was reasonable. He was sinus rhythm in the 70s, but was having some ectopy um, and atrial fibrillation would have been um, you know, a poorly tolerated rhythm for him. So we started some amiodarone uh, to try and suppress his ectopy, slow him down a little bit. Um, uh, which did seem to make a bit of a difference. Then you want to decrease LV contractility. And so um, the first thing we did was stop his inotropes that we had started, which certainly made things worse for him, um, and, and consider beta blockers. Now, you have to consider the right ventricle in this. If the RV is fine, then beta blockers will absolutely help you. Um, in him, there was some RV dysfunction, which we'll talk about in a minute. So you have to be a little bit careful with this. If you make your RV contractility worse, that impacts your ability to fill the left ventricle, which then makes the physiology worse. Um, so we're a little bit cautious about beta blockers in him initially. Then the next thing you can do is increase your afterload. So you want to drive up your mean arterial pressure and help essentially push that mitral apparatus posteriorly. So he was already on norepinephrine, um, but we started vasopressin and subsequently phenylephrine to make his, you know, MAP-80 and try and help this physiology. Then if you have failed all medical therapy, then there is surgical therapy that can be considered. Um, and so if you have hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, you can consider a surgical septal myectomy. So get rid of that bulging septum in the LVO flow tract. Um, and if you're post mitral valve repair, you consider going back in and uh, improving your repair or the extreme would be to re replace the mitral valve. So in terms of, of our case, what we did was we stopped the inodilator that he was on that certainly made him worse. Um, and then we drove up his map with vasopressin, phenylephrine and norepinephrine, which just those maneuvers alone um, brought his SVO2 from 40 up to the mid 50s um, and he started peeing again and things were, were definitely starting to turn around. Um, the amiodarone I think suppressed his ectopy and slowed him down from kind of the mid 70s down to the 60s which helped. Um, and then as his filling, right heart filling pressures came down um, gave a little bit of gentle volume. Um, and in that what you know I think very interestingly what happened is his PA pressures decreased, which I think represented um, his severe MR getting better. I think that pulmonary hypertension was all due to uh, severe mitral valve regurgitation from the SEM. Now, over the next 18 hours, he started to kind of slide again, um, and his PA cath numbers suggested that this was driven by, predominantly by RV dysfunction. So Andrew re-echoed him and, you know, this was confirmed that his RV was struggling. And you can appreciate that if you're trying to, if a major treatment goal here is to fill a thick, stiff left ventricle in order to not have SAM, um, that you need a good RV to achieve this. 
but yet the addition of inotropes um, to achieve that will make the SAM worse. So the combination of RV dysfunction and SAM is a very difficult physiologic situation to manage. Um, so we started some inhaled nitric oxide, which um, you know, in theory helps the right ventricle without impacting your left side, um, which did appear to maybe improve things a little bit. Um, then the other thing that came to light is that his, um, there was some concern of ischemia in his right coronary artery. His troponin had gone from 200 to 2000, um, and that combined with the RV dysfunction on echo, um, we proceeded to the cath lab and he had a mid-RCA lesion that was advertised only as 30 to 40% on his pre-op cath. But with IVIS, um, it, it looked more like 80%. And so we stented his right coronary artery. And importantly, though, what we were looking for is when, um, you know, the report was that a 21 millimeter valve was tight and difficult to get in. Uh, I was concerned a little bit about that that valve could have could be obstructing the ostium as right coronary artery, but with intravascular ultrasound of his right coronary ostium, uh, it was clear that that was widely patent. Um, so he got a stent to his right coronary artery, um, and you know, essentially gradually improved over the next 24 hours. Was able to wean the nitric, uh, wean the vasopressors. Um, now, whether it was a combination of the nitric and the PCI to his right, or one one or the other, I'm not totally clear, um, but in all, uh, uh, at the end of the day, he did uh, gradually improve, was able to be extubated, and is now recovering um, upstairs. So I think in retrospect, when you look at his echo, um, he definitely had a susceptible LV. He had you know, severe concentric LVH. He had a very small left ventricular outflow tract. Um, his pathology was driven predominantly or in great deal by his severe aortic insufficiency. You replace his aortic valve, and now a big volume load on that left ventricle was removed. So you make the LV size even smaller. That combined with bleeding um, postoperatively, um, I'm sure made this physiology worse. Um, perhaps if he had had a TE during his take back, some of this might have been um, identified. Then you have concomitant respiratory failure, which impacts your ability of the right ventricle to fill the left, which I'm sure made this situation worse. And then the initiation of inotropic support definitely made the situation worse. And then you might have had some RV dysfunction due to right coronary ischemia, which thrown on top of that. So I think in this patient, even though it wasn't the classic um, hokum post septomyectomy or mitral valve repair, uh, patient, I think there's a lot of variables here that likely contributed to the development um, of this physiology um, and his initial physiologic decline. Um, so I, I'm not sure if if that's clear. I, I hope that that um, perhaps if if uh, some of you were unclear of what SAM was and how it worked and why this is an important thing to think about, I hope that's a little more clear. I you know we can answer some questions. Uh, perhaps it might clarify some of this information, but I think from a, a management on the, you know, in the ICU and on the on the step down unit and ward, I think it's really important to remember, especially in hokum patients that have had a myectomy um, or post mitral valve repair patients, that uh, these are patients that we want to be aggressive with beta blockers, keep their heart rate low, be very cautious with diuretics. Um, and you don't mind letting their blood pressures run a little on the higher side. And, you know, I think those are important principles for managing um, hokum and, and uh, mitral valve repair patients postoperatively. Um, so I'm happy to take some questions now if anyone has any. Chris, can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Chris, that was a great talk. Fantastic. And I think really fulfills the mandate of what we're trying to accomplish educationally. Uh, obviously, uh, it, um, it helps to have a case because it kind of really puts it into context. Two really quick questions, and then I'll open it up to the floor for another couple of quick questions. Uh, number one, um, it, it always feels like SAM is more of a, a perioperative phenomenon, i.e. You, you see it more post-surgery as opposed to seeing it in people who haven't been operated before. Uh, 
and I know that's not necessarily the case, but it always feels that way. And maybe it's because of what we do. How are, what's, what's in, in this particular patient, what's the long-term strategy as far as keeping them from, because it's not like you've gone back in and done a septal or now replaced with mitral valve. Um, what's the long-term strategy as far as trying to keep this patient from having SAM again? Uh, and my second question is, is there a role for, uh, is synchronous AV pacing versus just ventricular pacing? You know, should we be putting atrial wires in all of these people in whom we're concerned that there may be SAM after the fact, i.e., you know, hypertrophied ventricle, uh, you know, smallish ventricular cavity, et cetera? Yeah, I think those are great questions. That JF also on the chat asked the same question about the the long term impact um, in these patients, and I mean the the data would suggest that the majority of post operative SAM we see gets better with medical therapy and isn't an issue. Um, uh, now that being said, there is certainly a subset of patients that fail that medical therapy in the operating room, um, and you have to go back on bypass, for example, and and resect more septum or or improve your repair of your mitral valve so um and we, i mean the the details of additional mitral valve repair i think is probably a topic for another day but um i think why this happens post-op and wasn't there pre-op i think depends a little bit on the physiology that we're talking about whether it's post mitral or post um septal myectomy but i think there's a lot of variables that also contribute one i think you have some transient RV dysfunction just by nature of having been on pump, arresting the heart. Um, you know, I'm sure your, your PVR might not be normal. So there's probably some uh, change in the ability of the right heart to fill the left heart. And then there's inevitably some diastolic dysfunction in an already thick, stiff LV by nature of having been on bypass, arresting the heart, trying to get good myocardial protection of a very thick, stiff LV, you know, is is not or can can be a challenge. Um, so I think there are reasons why the physiology gets a bit worse in the average case. And then if you think of, and then post mitral valve repair, um, inevitably the the repair work that is done moves the mitral apparatus anteriorly a little bit in general by nature of putting in a ring. Um, the repair itself all worsen a little bit the echocardiographic predictors of of SAM. Um, so I think there are things that we do intraoperatively that do contribute and and bring this to light when you first come off bypass or in the early post-operative course. But as those things resolve post-op, the RV function gets a bit better, the diastolic function gets a bit better, we can optimize our medical therapy, then in most patients it's not a problem long term. Um, is, you know, I think kind of the short take-home message. Um, in, in, uh, and answer, what was your, your second question? AV pacing versus right, the, right. Uh, ventricular pacing. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's probably, a, every, everybody might have a different opinion on that. I, I put in A wires in, in um, patients that have, you know, bad aortic stenosis patients that have really thick, stiff ventricles. Um, you know, I, I, I think that that's a, um, trying to do everything to maintain a, a AV synchrony is a good thing. Now, in the in the um, SAM patient population, particularly in Hokum, there you know there are talk there is some evidence to say that this synchronous pacing may be better for them. That it actually um, uh, improves SAM a little bit and LV outflow tract obstruction having a dyssynchronous LV. Um, you know, that's kind of in the way down in the algorithm of LV outflow tract obstruction and, and in the hokum patient population specifically. Um, but I agree. I think postoperatively people with bad, thick, stiff left ventricles, I think having A-wires is important. But I'm sure every surgeon uh, probably has a different opinion on that. A couple of uh, quick questions, I guess, on the chat. Um, uh, Craig asked if there was any hint of uh, problems in the intraoperative PE, post aortic valve replacement, replacement of ascending aorta. Yeah, so um, this this was uh, was was not my case, but um, talking to um, Ashley about when all this was going on in the ICU, I, I chatted with him and, and Zlatko, and um, 
there, you know, Ashley said there wasn't in the initial post-operative course there, you know, he said there was, there was, was not obvious Sam um, and the, um, and the preoperative trans thoracic echo also did not really mention any concern of, of, of SAM and LVL flow tract obstruction. Ashley's echo report said mild elevation of the gradients in the LVL flow tract post bypass, but there's no evidence of, of SAM. And I, I think that speaks to just the series of events postoperatively that all kind of added up to create this, um, to create this problem. They also, you know, Zlatko and, and, um, um, and Ashley also said that the, the right corneostrum was very low and very difficult to see. And so getting cardioplegia down, it was, you know, not immediate. Um, and, and that also, the fact that it was a very low lying right was what kind of prompted us to go to the cath lab to see if that valve was obstructing the right coronary artery at all. Uh, but there may have been a, a bit of additional RV dysfunction related to that. Yeah. And then uh, last question from Sue. Uh, well, nice words from Tina, by the way. Thank you, Tina. Uh, uh, Sue asked about three to six months down the road, um, could this patient decompensate if he ever were to become dehydrated? Say, for instance, he has flu, COVID-19, uh, or just simply a Sunday morning hangover. I mean, I think that's a very interesting question. I don't know that I have the answer to that that is data-driven in any sense, but I think in my mind, the take-home message is that he has an LV that is susceptible, um, and given the right set of hemodynamic and physiologic circumstances, he, he could have this physiology occur, clearly. Now, I think that probably post-operatively, um, I don't think any patient at home could ever have the degree of hemodynamic and physiologic derangements that we induce post-operatively um, with regards to um, ischemia from an operation, then bleeding, then um, you know impacts on on RV dysfunction, respiratory failure requiring reintubation. I don't think that we could ever really um, uh, you know induce that kind of severe derangements in physiology um, post hangover. But you know it's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. I think getting him on good medical therapy and sending him home well beta blocked. Um, you know, is going to be is going to be important. Um, I think you're right, and I think the other thing that JF alluded to in his chat comments is that, you know, between I think between just patient's normal physiology and the fact that you know his LVH may even get a little bit better post valve replacement, you know, his risk may be lower long term. Uh, so I mean, it remains to be seen. But as you said, uh, you know, his pathology was AI also, right? So yeah. Uh, yeah. there's, there was a combination of factors going in. All right. And I'm just going to just, the last, last question, uh, is, uh, from uh, Craig, just about whether or not there was any value to doing an amyloid workup in this patient. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree, Craig, I think, you know, looking at his echo and then, and then the, the consensus on his aortic valve, I, I agree. There seems to be something missing here, you know, like it doesn't, when with a primary driving factor being aortic insufficiency, the way his LV looks to me doesn't add up at all, nor does it add up in a 49 year old with a tri-leaflet valve. It just seems funny to me. So uh, I agree. I think, it's, I think it's yeah, worth looking at education. whether this guy has, has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or some other form of cardiomyopathy. I agree. Sorry, answer. What were you saying? Yeah, no, 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 that's fine. Uh, what I was going to say was that for everyone's education, amyloid is becoming increasingly popular, and this may be another topic for another day, but amyloid deposition within the heart as a potential cause for uh, heart failure, cardiomyopathy, restrictive and or constrictive cardiomyopathy is, is something that's gaining increasing popularity. Uh, you'll start to hear it a lot more, and you'll start to see us ordering more tests. To this effect, Dave Buick, for instance, is, is quite hot on this particular subject. So anyway, once again, I think we can discuss this later, but that's why that question was especially relevant. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to bring the session to a close. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank Chris um, for having uh, put this uh, talk together. Uh, I'll be presenting next week, so i.e. the uh, 6th of May. 
Um, two things I would just like to bring to people's attention. The CCS is hosting uh, weekly webinars. Tonight's webinar is on the subject of critical care uh, as it relates to COVID-19. Next week, uh, the surgeons actually across Canada, the Canadian Society of Cardiac Surgeons are holding a webinar uh, on the subject of cardiac surgery during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, yours truly will be moderating. JF will be one of the speakers and we have speakers from across the country. So. Uh, if you see this come across your uh, email, feel free to join uh, the webinar. I think it'll be of great interest to everyone. And then last but not least, thank you once again. And uh, there's a recurring invite, obviously, but I, I will make sure to send an email out the night before uh, with the topic and just the, the Zoom link once again so that people have it uh, easily handy.